Today on Rise Up, Rituals in Religion. Are laws and rituals in religion the same since the beginning till today, or are they changing? Next, we discuss the covenants of God and how the seventh covenant with the riser Abdullah Hashem Abba al Sadiq is the latest contract between God and mankind today. Misconceptions in Sunni Islam, a discussion on a key misconception regarding the Mahdi and why it is not valid. And finally, we are joined by special guest Yahya Al Al Mahdi, who discusses his journey with us and what it means to be a true supporter of God. This is Rise Up. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Rise Up. My name is Alia Halal. A very good morning to everybody. My name is Irfan Alamgir, and welcome to Rise Up. This is our morning program that we do every morning, uh, barring Saturdays, Yes. on the satellite channel. And it is a satellite channel that is dedicated to spreading a very, very important message to the world. And that message is that the Savior of mankind is now amongst us. He is known as the Mahdi. He's known as the Qaim of the family of Muhammad. We're talking about an individual who was mentioned by name in the final will and testament of Prophet Muhammad. And his name is Abdullah Hashim also known as Abba As-Sadiq, as we call him, which means the father of the truthful. And he's that prophesied character who is meant to come in this day and age and bring peace and justice to the world by taking the people to what Jesus Christ promised to be the kingdom of heaven on earth. Uh, and we call that the divine just state. So we are his companions and we're bringing you the glad tidings of his appearance. That's a bit of an intro that we like to do every morning before yeah. we jump into the show. Yeah, and it's a very heavy introduction. I mean, you just uh, reeled off some very big names. And, uh, you know, to say that the Mahdi's here, to say that Jesus is here, uh, to say that we are living in the times that we're living in, and people should be looking for a man appointed by God, a man who is saying to the people, gather around me and let's build a new uh, uh, heaven on earth. These are really big claims, and these are claims that we make on a daily basis going live to the continent of Africa and Europe. And we are very confident in our claims because we believe that we have indeed found the promised, uh, the promised Savior of mankind in this day and age. We have found the Jesus in this day and age that was promised to come uh, and the Muhammad. And he is called Abdullah Hashim Abba al Sadiq. And he has come with proofs that all the previous covenant bringers came with in order to identify him. And these are the proofs that we are now going to talk about on the show. We talk about them on a daily basis because we hope that uh, every time we go live, someone is tuning in for the first time and when they hear uh, us reeling off the introduction, they're going to be uh, wowed and intrigued and take an interest in what we're talking about because we are talking about uh, that promised time that uh, the earth has been waiting for when finally uh, a man appointed by God, God himself through his spirit rules on earth and creates justice and creates the conditions that are necessary for mankind to flourish to its uh, full potential. Yes, absolutely. And it's very critical that we bring to you the evidence that we say that we know about, that we bring to you the teachings of the Riser of Sadiq and we present them to you in front of you, that we discuss them together so that those who are listening in know that this is a platform where you can actually hear about these teachings and understand the call very well. It's also a platform where you can call in and actually talk about it with us. People have done so before, believers and those who are still taking an interest and trying to research the call and find out uh, what it is we're talking about. So the, the good thing is you can always call in, we can always talk about it together because it's a very important matter and we believe that it is central to our existence. We don't think that anything takes precedence over this matter in terms of being of value because if we uh, reject or neglect the matter of the man sent by God, then we are essentially disbelieving in God himself. That is the way we see it. There are those out there who believe that religion entails that you follow God alone, which means you don't need an intermediary. You don't need that, that middleman yeah. who can help you communicate with God. Uh, but history will show and scripture will show that that is absolutely not the case. You can't really have a religion without having a living messenger amongst you who can take you to God himself. Uh, this is something we really strongly believe in. And it's not just us who said it. It's in scripture, as we said. 
and it's in the narrations. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, was very clear when he said that those who die without pledging allegiance to the Imam of their time will die the death of ignorance. And that's a heavy uh, message. And it means that there's something very important to take heed of, which is there is an Imam in each day and age. Yes. There is a man that God sends in each day and age, and we need to know who he is. That's yes. what's critical. We need to know who he is, and uh, we need to know how to recognize him. Uh, this is a fundamental uh, tenant and principle in this dawah that we have to educate ourselves on. And we've said it, we've said it that uh, to recognize a man appointed by God, he needs to be appointed by a pre preceding prophet or messenger or imam. Mm -hmm. And this has been the case uh, from the very beginning of the human story, and it is the case today. Abu Sadiq uh, has claimed his right as the promised Mahdi uh, through a document that was written uh, over 1400 years ago by the Holy Prophet Muhammad and in it he mentioned uh, 12 successors would be Imams and after them 12 Mahdi's and Abu Sadiq's name is mentioned along with Ahmed and Al Mahdi and these are the first three of the Mahdi's that come after the 12 Imams so the Prophet Muhammad was concerned about his uh, nation and he said this is the document that if you follow it you will never go astray it's been alluded to in Sunni as well as Shia narrations it's just been lost in time because of the corruptions that have unfortunately entered into the religion and this is another big part of what we do we expose those people introducing these corruptions into the religion who are the non-working scholars in every day and age the people who wear the guise and robes of religion but are the furthest thing away from it and uh, we have to say that uh, they are the number one enemy in terms of uh, those who seek a path to God they mm. uh, hold all the um, they, 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 they've shut all the gates, they don't let others enter, nor do they enter themselves, and this is why they must be exposed and dissociated from. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the dawah, this is the dawah of the Mahdi, and the people have to rally around, recognize the true Imam, and recognize that without the Spirit of God being present in every day and age, the earth would uh, collapse and cease to exist. There has to be a spirit from God in every day and age and the narration Aliya spoke about with the Prophet Muhammad clearly indicates that this is the case and he mentioned that he would, uh, there would be a Messiah emerging from his nation called the Mahdi and he has indeed appeared as Jesus did before him to the Israelites. And perhaps people might be wondering, well then who, who is the Prophet we believe in or the Messenger? We believe in all the Prophets and Messengers that came from the time of Adam till now. And uh, these prophets and messengers we know are a lineage of men that came from father till son till it reached the final messenger and prophet and that was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. And from him came the 12 Imams and the 12 Mahdi's who are also mentioned in his final will and testament. So it is known that there will be a vicegerent of God on earth but the prophets and messengers are amongst those vicegerents that we are mentioning to you. So whatever religion you believe in, uh, whether you're uh, from the Jewish faith, from the Christian faith, the prophets mentioned in the Torah and also the Eastern prophets uh, and those who were found in the West to be those great philosophers that are mentioned um, in the goal of the wise by the rise of Basadik to be prophets such as Socrates and Aristotle. We believe in all of these names, the known and unknown prophets and messengers. And uh, a question that someone recently asked, and I think it would be great to answer that. Can you believe in some of the vicegerents, but not all of them, and still be on the right path? Can you believe in, let's say, Jesus Christ and not continue on and, uh, and stop there, basically, and be on the right path? Or could you believe in Muhammad and not believe in Ali ibn Abi Talib, and so on and so forth? Could you believe in the 12th Imam, but not the Mahdi's after him, and be a believer? Yes, that's a, that's a question that often gets posed and I think the very resounding answer to that question is absolutely not. Um, they are the, uh, there are a continuous chain mm. and this chain extends in length every time as time passes and a new um, uh, section like of that link. chain is added, a new link is yeah. added in every day and age. So uh, if you do believe in Jesus, then 2,000 years ago you are able to grab onto this chain. If you, if you were alive 1400 years ago and you recognize the Prophet Muhammad, then that's another few links on that chain and you can grab onto it and find salvation and be pulled out of the chaos and corruptions on earth. 
And now the chain has had several more new links added to it. And the last of those links is uh, Abbas Sadiq, the riser of the family of Muhammad. And uh, the simple answer to the question is uh, that if you do not acknowledge and accept all of the prophets and messengers that go back to Adam, peace be upon him, the first vicegerent of God on the earth, then you certainly uh, cannot grab onto this uh, rope of salvation that extends from the heavens. And every uh, person who is alive today has to accept and acknowledge the previous vicegerents in order to have a relationship with God. And in this day and age, that, that chain is still there. It just has a different name, that yes. link. And that name is something that we have to be able to recognize as uh, a name that is in that continuous chain, uh, one of the names which is Abdullah Hashim. Now, we wanted to jump now into the, uh, the topic that we wanted to discuss with everyone and hopefully call in if you'd like to be part of the conversation. But before we go into our theme, uh, perhaps we could uh, basically reiterate that update that is very important for everyone to know about, which yes. has to do with the Mehdi Has Appeared YouTube channel. Uh, the fact that there is exclusive content now being uh, published there, which you could uh, easily sign up for. And that, how much is it? It's like a less than a dollar a month? Less than a dollar a month. Your donations go purely into humanitarian missionary works around the world when it comes to spreading the call, when it comes to assisting and giving resources to persecuted groups and minorities and standing up for minorities that are not able to stand up for themselves in various countries. These uh, activities that we do, these works that we're trying to do in the name of God, your donations go purely into those uh, into those uh, realms. So thank you for uh, lending a hand to yes. God in a time where very few care about humanity and care about making the world a better place. And uh, on the plus side, while you're doing so, you get to access that exclusive content by the Riser of Asadik, where people are asking very great questions, actually. People are sending questions in. There's actually an email address that you can send the questions in on the Mehdi Has Appeared YouTube channel. So if you go to the YouTube channel, you'll find that email address. You can directly email the riser of Asadik and you will receive an answer, hopefully, possibly, as many have already, on the exclusive content section. So don't miss out on that. And also another plus point mm -hmm. is the community posts that the Raiser Basadik is writing himself on the channel. Yes, um, this is uh, really, I mean, I've seen some of those questions, uh, yes. some really amazing questions, the things people grapple with on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, lots of people are signing on, as a matter yes, of fact. And this is very, very exciting to see, and they're uh, interested to become engaged and, uh, and to be able to access the uh, uh, exclusive material that is going to be coming out on that particular uh, forum. We have to make sure that uh, we take full advantage of this. Uh, Abbas Sadiq himself is taking out time from his very, very busy day to be able to answer those questions to the satisfaction of the people um, and God willing that they take heed uh, from the wisdom. And every single answer that Abbas Sadiq gives is layered with different meanings. So if you are one of those fortunate ones who do get their questions answered, really, really ponder deeply on the response because you will find that it is not only um, an answer to the question you ask, but there is much more wisdom implanted in that answer that you'll be able to decode if you truly, truly give it its uh, due attention. Mm. Uh, Abbas Sadiq is somebody who uh, speaks on many different levels to many different people according to their understanding but within the answer is also a little gem that you have to unearth by rereading it and uh, uh, seeing his message to you in, in a very personal way yes. and this is something that That's is so true. very very exciting and uh, we've all been with Abbas Sadiq, uh, us who, who are uh, fortunate enough to be living with him in his community uh, when we answer when we ask him a question sometimes he answers it and then you say okay fine I think I understand it and then three days later there'll be like another gem that you've unearthed mm -hmm. that comes in a specific situation so for the people around the world to have that same uh, kind of uh, relationship with him now through this forum is, is a very exciting opportunity and I really hope that uh, the people who are lucky enough to get their questions answered really really take the answer seriously and take them to heart and then implement them because there will always be something that will be pushing you to act in a way that is taking you one step closer to God. Of course, having that intention that every believer should, which is to get closer to God with each and every action and with each and every day that passes. So um, make sure you don't miss out on that and don't uh, neglect that particular part of life, which is that Mehdi has appeared YouTube channel because 
it is a very essential thing to have in your life if you're on a spiritual journey towards God and if you believe in the Rise of the or if you even are just simply someone who finds him inspiring and finds that watching him and listening to him is shaping your understanding of reality in a better way. It's honing uh, your ability to understand life and the universe and your relationship with your creator, then absolutely sign up for that and you will not be uh, disappointed whatsoever. Now, if we go towards our theme, we wanted to talk about this topic. We've talked about it a few times. We want to go a bit more deeper into it. And that's the idea that... So, uh, let's start off with a question, mm -hmm. which is that, is it is it the case that religion is, or understanding God, is based on the laws and the rituals? Right. Right? So, this mm. is something that is kind of conditioned into our psyche very, very, very point, deeply. Yeah. I think that it's hard to to basically separate ourselves from that idea unless we really sit down and, and realize it's there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us perhaps didn't even realize it was there until we found the truth and until we pledged allegiance to God through the Rise of the mm. So let's talk about that. Is yeah. it the case? Is it the fact that we have to adhere to those rituals and laws otherwise we are bad people or we're not with God? Yeah, no, it's a very good question, Ali, and uh, I think it opens up a very, very uh, big uh, discussion and debate because Religion, as you said, is very much uh, programmed into the psyche of the people to be a book of rules and regulations, of rituals, of things that you perform on a daily basis in terms of uh, practices uh, like the uh, prayer five times a day in which you take time out of your uh, busy schedule uh, you know, uh, and, and get those five or ten minutes a few times a day mm -hmm. and devote it to God. And the idea is, is to remain conscious that there is a greater being uh, and your life has a greater purpose and this world is not all that there is. And it's a way to sort of program your mind to the alternative version of reality. Mm -hmm. But uh, is it the entirety of religion? Uh, because if you are praying without an awareness of the true meaning and purpose of prayer, will you uh, benefit from the fruits of the prayer? Mm. That's the thing. Um, and we have, I think, Ali, have proven over and over again that religion is not just about uh, the rituals and practices. These are the apparent acts of worship. They, this is the exterior. There is an inner aspect of religion, mm -hmm. a core from which these practices sprout forth. And really that core that we've spoken about, uh, which gives rise to these practices, which are essentially practices of self-discipline, um, they have a deeper meaning and purpose. And that is to condition the mind actually to be aware of the Spirit of God that comes in the form of a man. And this is, of course, where the statement religion is a man uh, becomes so prominent uh, within our dawah. And we are very, very keen to talk about this and make people aware about this, that it is not the acts of worship or the rules and regulations that come because as times have changed and uh, history teaches us, that as times change, as conditions of humanity change, the rules and regulations change accordingly. And we saw this uh, transitioning from, for example, uh, Prophet Noah's time, when it was just his family, his three sons and their three wives, uh, going to Prophet Moses when there were 600,000 Israelites marching their way out of Egypt towards the Promised Land. Uh, this necessitated that uh, the rules change with mm. the coming of a new man from God. And the man is the one who brings the law. And he brings the law in accordance with the conditions of the society at that time. So um, we can definitely uh, go more into this, which is that the, the practices or the rituals that the prophet messenger teaches the people in that specific time is for those specific people at that specific time. And this is a key distinction that we have to make. Yes. And on a moral level, if people are worried in general, if someone is, for example, from the Jewish faith and they think to themselves, well, if I don't uh, follow the Sabbath, then I will displease God. Or if someone is from the Muslim faith and they say, if I don't pray five times a day ritualistically in this fashion, then I'm not praying. Mm. Now, we don't say that prayer is not part of religion. Of course it is. But what we do say is that we need to identify why it is that not following that ritual or not following that practice is wrong in the first place. Is it because this practice is um, the whole point of religion or is it because the person who introduced that practice or introduced that ritual 
is a man that we want to obey. Right, right. Like, what is the principle behind mm -hmm. why that practice is so important and why it's important to stick to it? Now, hypothetically, if that person were to now come, let's say Prophet Muhammad says, pray five times a day. Yes. But let's say then he himself says, now stop praying five times a day. What's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if Prophet Muhammad were to change the law or transform the law, just as Jesus Christ yes. transformed the law in the time of Moses, he knew there were laws. And then when Jesus himself comes, he says, yes, I follow Moses, but... And then he starts doing these little changes mm -hmm. and he's starting to introduce a new covenant and people start feeling very taken aback and they say, no, you can't do that. But Jesus is from Moses. Mm. So for him to transform that law, should it be such a big deal? It really shouldn't because at the end of the day, they're from the same source. They're both from God and they are both successors of that spirit. So why should that be a problem? Mm. That could only be a problem if we don't realize why we do what we do. Yes, yes. I think that's the crux of it, isn't that's it? That's the real crux of it. It's about, it's not about attachment to the law, it's mm. about attachment to the man who brings the law. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu you gave his example, I mean, he did it in, in his lifetime. And it always serves as a really big test because what happens is the non-working scholars who come and try to usurp the rights of the Prophet Messenger or the Imam of the time, they are experts in uh, making the people un believe that it is the law that is the most important part because then that allows them to uh, exactly. gain the ascendancy, right? And then they say, look, it's about the law. And Umar al-Khattab said it himself uh, when the Holy Prophet was about to appoint Imam Ali. He said, the Quran is enough for exactly. us. We have a book, a book of laws that tells us how to live. We really don't need Ali bin Abi Talib. And the Prophet's insisting that you do need him, actually. And you, need you need a teacher and interpreter. Exactly. Because then the law becomes open to interpretation. Then you get people who talk about the taqlid, i.e. imitate me, and then they become the man appointed by God through self-appointment. But just coming back to the example of the Prophet Muhammad, when he changed the Qibla, from That's a great example. Jerusalem to Mecca, where the Kaaba is supposed to be. And he said, no, this is the new Qibla for the Muslims. A lot of people, particularly those from the Jewish and Christian background, said, okay, that's it. He's opening a new religion for himself. That's it. It's over. It's finished. And they fell out of Islam and they fell out with the Prophet Muhammad. It was heavy for them. They didn't like that there was such a big dramatic change. Exactly. But Muhammad Wali is the law and he can change the law as and when he pleases because he has the Holy Spirit with him. And this is the crucial point. And uh, the scholars of misguidance, like I said, they are like, let's just focus on the laws, forget the man. The laws are telling us everything we pretty much need. Muhammad's purpose uh, was just to come and teach us these mm. laws. Now we don't need him anymore, actually. So uh, goodbye, Prophet Muhammad, and take this will, and you do with it what you want. We're going to have the Quran here on our side, and we're going to do what we want to do, because we understand the, uh, the religion better than you do now, and we're going to create our own uh, counter-caliphate, and while we do so, we are going to murder everybody that you mentioned in your will that is supposed to guide us. And when this happens, and this always happens at the end of every religion, God comes and he sends a man with a new covenant. And this is the whole point that we're trying to make. And this is why the Prophet Muhammad said, go and give allegiance to this man who is going to be called the Mahdi, who is going to come and revive the true religion in the end times. And this is where we're at right now. Exactly. This is where we stand. We stand uh, in that same situation as the Israelites did when Jesus came. And they're like, okay, the Sabbath, the, 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 the rabbis, the uh, Pharisees are telling us that we can't do anything on the Sabbath. We're going to sit right here, do absolutely nothing, and just uh, wait for the Messiah to come. Mashiach will come and he will uh, throw out the Romans. He'll create the kingdom of David uh, back again the way it was when life was sweet and uh, the Messiah comes. And the first thing the Messiah does is he starts deliberately doing things on the Sabbath. Yes. He starts healing people. He starts doing miracles deliberately to make a point that he has come, he is the Messiah, and one of the things the Messiah will do is to change the law. But the minds of the people at the time when Jesus was supposed to appear was so warped by the uh, clerics of the religion that they uh, completely rejected the Messiah. Yes. Messiah said, I am the Sabbath. And he said something very revolutionary, which, which, which shows the principle behind what you're saying, which is where he says that 
man was not created for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was created right. for man. Exactly. Meaning that the, the man himself has more value here than the ritual right. or the practice. Yes. And when he said, I'm the Sabbath, he says, this means that I know what to do on the Sabbath better than you because I am the Sabbath. So he would say these things to the Israelites and it irked them no end. And because they had fallen under the illusion, uh, under the mirage created by the uh, clerics of the time, they opposed their Messiah and they chose Barabbas over Jesus and they wanted to crucify him and they led the, uh, the vigilante that uh, was uh, taking Jesus to his demise. And uh, this is what happened then and this is what is beginning to take a shape now with scholars of the religion coming live on our satellite channels and saying that if the Mahdi was to appear and fight our scholars, we would fight him and nay, we would try to kill him. So history is repeating itself. These are signs for the people to contemplate on and take action to prevent the same fate as what the Israelites did when the Messiah Jesus rose uh, back in Israel. So we have a lot of really great examples in history. We wanted to go and uh, watch some of them for, our, for ourselves. Uh, Brother Ardian presented a few of those examples in history. We're going to see what those examples are and then we're going to talk about how they relate to us right now in this day and age. So let's uh, see what Ardian had to say about the changing of the covenants through time yes. and the different rituals and practices that we saw evolving over the times. History has shown us that humanity's relationship with God is ever evolving. At pivotal moments, God has established covenants, sacred agreements tailored to the spiritual and social needs of humanity at that time. These covenants introduce new laws and rituals, guiding humanity closer to divine truth. But these changes often came with resistance. People struggled to accept the unfamiliar, mistaking their traditions for the essence of God's truth. Yet the covenants demonstrate a profound reality. The rituals and laws may change, but God's principle of sending a man from himself, a guide filled with his spirit, remains constant. Today, we'll journey through these covenants, explore the lessons they teach us, and understand why the seventh covenant is a momentous call for humanity. After the flood, God made a covenant with Noah, a fundamental moment for humanity. The Noah covenant was simple, yet profound. God promised never to destroy the earth by flood ever again. He established basic moral principles, such as the sanctity of life and the prohibition against murder. This covenant reflected the early stages of humanity's spiritual development. It was designed for a world recovering from destruction, providing a basic framework for order and justice. But humanity was destined for growth. As we advanced, God prepared us for deeper spiritual understanding. There are examples in history of covenants bringing new laws and abolishing old practices. With Abraham, God introduced a covenant that went beyond basic morality. Abraham's covenant was marked by circumcision, a physical sign of God's promise. But more importantly, it introduced new laws and rituals, setting Abraham's descendants apart as a chosen people. This covenant was not just about physical lineage, but spiritual readiness. God promised Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars and that they would inherit the land of Canaan. The laws Abraham received symbolized a higher spiritual responsibility, preparing his people for the future. Yet even Abraham's covenant was not the final word. As his descendants multiplied, their spiritual need changed and God responded by sending another guide. Centuries after Abraham, the Israelites found themselves enslaved in Egypt. Their physical as well as their spiritual bondage called for a new covenant. God sent Moses, who led the Israelites out of Egypt and out of slavery and brought them into Mount Sinai. There, God delivered the law, 
a detailed set of instructions that formed the foundation of the Mosaic Covenant. This covenant was revolutionary in several ways. First of all, the Ten Commandments were a universal moral code that emphasized justice, worship, and human dignity. And second, ritual laws were established with clear regulations on diet, worship, and community living that reinforced the Israelites' identity as God's chosen people. And also, the tabernacle was introduced as a physical space for God's presence among His people, symbolizing a closer relationship between the divine and humanity. However, as comprehensive as the Mosaic Law was, it was not eternal. Its purpose was to guide the Israelites in their journey through the wilderness and establish them as a nation. Over time, its rituals became burdensome and its spirit was often lost in legalism. God, in His wisdom, prepared humanity for yet another evolution. When Jesus Christ appeared, He brought a new message that challenged the established norms of society. He fulfilled the law of Moses while introducing a new covenant based on love, grace, and last but not least, spiritual rebirth. Jesus' teachings revolutionized how people understood their relationship with God. He emphasized the importance of inner purity over external rituals. He taught that true worship came from the heart, not just adhering to some laws and rules. The New Covenant emphasized God's mercy and the opportunity for redemption, regardless of one's past. And this radical shift was actually very difficult for many to accept. And the religious scholars of that time rejected Jesus, although He was their Messiah. And not for any reason except that He did not conform to their expectations. This resistance serves as a powerful lesson for us today. Centuries after Jesus, God sent Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, with the Qur'an, marking the Sixth Covenant. This covenant, however, addressed the complexity of a rapidly expanding and diverse world. The Qur'an provided guidance for both the personal and societal matters, including justice, economics, and governance. It emphasized the oneness of God and the unity of humanity, breaking down tribal divisions. The teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, integrated spiritual devotion with practical living, creating a holistic way of life. This covenant was another step in humanity's spiritual journey. Yet even the family of Muhammad, peace be upon them all, foretold of a future guide, the Riser, or better known as the Qa'im, who would bring new laws and renew God's guidance for the final stage of human history. The scriptures and traditions of many faiths speak of the Riser, a figure who would bring the final covenant, this awaited guide, also known as the Qa'im, was prophesied to introduce new laws and abolish outdated practices, and also completing God's plan for humanity. Abdullah Hashim, Abu al-Sadiq, from him is peace, has fulfilled this prophecy. As the riser, he has ushered in the seventh covenant, bringing humanity into the final era of divine guidance. And through his teachings, the laws and rituals have been renewed, tailored to the needs of our time. This covenant is a call to spiritual maturity, requiring us to transcend and pass and embrace God's evolving plan. The story of the covenants reveal an unchanging truth. God's law and rituals are not fixed. They change as humanity grows. What remains constant, however, is God's principle of sending a man from himself, a guide filled with his spirit, who leads us according to his will. This is a critical lesson for us today. 
If we cling to the familiar, mistaking tradition for truth, we risk rejecting God's messenger in our time. And the Israelites, for example, rejected Jesus, Jesus Christ, because he challenged their expectations. Today, humanity stands at a crossroads. The seventh covenant calls upon all of us to rise above our divisions and also to embrace the divine truth for our time. This is an invitation to align with God's plan, to walk with his messenger, and to become part of the final chapter of humanity's spiritual journey. Do not let the fear of change hold you back. Do not let the mistakes of the past define your future. Join the seventh covenant. Answer God's call. And the time is now. Very humbling lessons being uh, shown in that particular segment by Brother Aryan Al Mahdi, and so many questions come to mind when you're listening uh, to what he's saying. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, realizations that you can now place in your understanding when you see the system that God placed, when you see the structure of how He works, and that's when you realize the patterns that pop up. That's when you understand that okay, God has a perspective on religion, and people have have uh, interpreted a certain perspective for themselves because of the scholars of religion that decided that they are the ones who know best. So God's perspective was very clear. He said, I'm going to send someone to you, obey him. And the scholars would say, well, this person came, he left, and his successor we're going to reject, mm. and we'll just do what we want with the teachings, and we'll say that this is the religion. And while that might make a lot of sense to many, it doesn't make a lot of sense to God. And he has, uh, he has allowed consequences to befall nations that have not realized his way of seeing it. So let's take the example of the Jewish nation that rejected mm. the Messiah. The Israelites were waiting for Jesus Christ. They were waiting for him to appear. And let's be honest, they knew from the Torah we find in the scriptures that they knew that the man from God should be ruling. He should be leading. He should be governing them. And that's why they had prophets like David and Solomon and many others who were actually kings over their people. And it was uh, unfortunate that a time came when the Messiah comes to them. And this Messiah is meant to be ruling and governing his people. Yet the people decide to have him prosecuted and persecuted by the ruling authorities of the time, mm. by the Roman Empire. And they go so far as to mock and deride him for being God's chosen king on earth, calling him the king of the Jews, placing a crown of thorns on his head in a, in a, in a way to deride what he's saying and to ridicule his idea. But the fact is he was the king of the Jews. And even if they made fun of it in that satanic, demonic way that they did, he was still the king chosen by God and the only king chosen by God. There was none other than Jesus Christ when he was living and amongst the people. So the fact that God would send a man to rule people and then the people would stick to their rituals so much that they want to get rid of that messenger, that is uh, something very concerning. And what happens right after? What happens to that nation right after? Yes. Are they able to thrive and prosper? Not very much so because then we find that the very authorities that they decided to throw their own Messiah into their hands and allow them to do whatever they wanted to him, uh, those very authorities, that very empire basically became the doom and destruction of the Israelites themselves. Yes, of course, we know the Romans sacked the city of uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD and they torched the city, they set it ablaze, they crushed Jerusalem under the might of the Roman uh, Empire, mm. and they, of course, dismantled and destroyed the very temple that the rabbis and the uh, clerics of religion, the Pharisees, were doing business in, mm. and they were busy rejecting and crucifying their Messiah. And like Alia said, that same force that they used to crucify him came down upon them in uh, all hell and fury, yes. and it completely leveled the city. So this is the aftermath. Mm -hmm. These are the consequences of rejecting God's caliph, rejecting their own king, and God exacted judgment upon Israel again. And this is not the first time it happened. They had been exiled before for doing the same to great prophets like Jeremiah, Isaiah, when they came, mm -hmm. and they came with the same message of hope, 
the Israelites were busy worshipping uh, Baal and the likes of him, these gods that came from the heathen nations yes. that had totally penetrated into the heart of Israel. So uh, after the exile came the complete destruction and once Jesus the Messiah was uh, uh, crucified in the apparent, God uh, never sent any more prophets to that nation and in fact he scattered the Israelites to all four corners of the earth uh, never to return again until in this day and age when the Mahdi or the Qaim or the family of Muhammad rises. And then of course we have the same example playing out. History repeats itself yes. so much that uh, it is quite eerie because Prophet Muhammad sallallahu comes and he is the greatest of all the messengers and he comes to a land in which he uh, begins to establish the divine just state. He goes a step beyond Jesus, the, uh, Jesus Christ and he actually does begin to lay the foundation uh, in the state of Medina where he was and he has followers and supporters who respect him because Muhammad sallallahu was, uh, he didn't compromise as much, he didn't turn the other cheek as much because mm. he saw what happened to his predecessor and it wasn't going to work and he established a military, he established uh, uh, a community much like Moses did and he came with laws and he came with discipline and uh, he was able to be more successful than Jesus the Messiah. And as that transition from the Prophet Muhammad to his successor Imam Ali was happening, this is where unfortunately Islam goes through that same pattern of devolution. They start to uh, reject the appointment of the Prophet and in fact uh, they put into place Abu Bakr and Umar as leaders without any authority, without any appointment and Islam begins to morph into something other than the Islam of the Holy Prophet. This is where the fracturing of the religion takes place and the sects are created and the inner turmoil begins. Mm. And uh, this is uh, what led to the uh, Banu Umayya taking uh, hold of the reins of the religion of the Messenger of Allah and changing it completely. And just as the temple in Jerusalem was leveled by the Romans, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, um, he not only butchers the Prophet's family, uh, you know, led by Imam al Hussein, but he also sets the Kaaba ablaze and obliterates it, just as the Romans did. And the same pattern plays out over and over again, and few reflect. And the reason they uh, that all of this happens is because that same ruse of shaitan, of the devil, uh, becomes successful again where people become attached to the law and the book but not the man. And this is why we always go astray and this is why uh, God sends successes to replace the successes because mankind just do not get the point mm. that religion is a man. No, exactly. That's that's the whole idea of it. Why was the temple destroyed? Why was the Holy Kaaba set on fire? Why would it be that these great places of worship were basically God just allowed that they get destroyed? Because for God, it's not about the, the brick and mortar. It's not about the stone or the geographical location. For God, it's about the spirit. And you cannot, uh, you cannot go in front of God and say to him, I prayed five times a day. But I rejected the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad that you sent. Mm. I, re I allowed that his head be severed from his body, but I still thought that prayer was more important. And I thought that my, my rituals and my, my worship and my practices had more value than to find and identify and obey and support the man that you commanded me to. For God, that is what counts more. Because if God can put a commandment down for a practice or ritual, he can also retract it. Mm. That is a right that he holds and that's something he's done through history and that's something that's prophesied to happen in the time of the Mahdi and that is something that is happening right now. Now if you're interested in knowing more about the seventh covenant, if you want to understand deeper what it is that the Riser of Basadik is bringing forward, what it is that God is allowing the people to be a part of in this day and age, then you need to read the goal of the wise, you need to read the seventh chapter that has to do with the seventh covenant. In fact, read all first seven chapters because it will give you a lot of context into how we've come to where we are today. So I think that that's a, a very uh, necessary topic that I hope that the viewers can take heed of and think about. Uh, a lot of food for thought there for everyone. And, um, and we can move on to our topic for the day, which comes right after.
and that has to do with a misconception, yes. a misconception in Sunni Islam. Uh, now, there are misconceptions in all religions, of course. There are different ideas that different religions hold. And there's a certain uh, particular one that we find in Sunni Islam that we wanted to break down for the viewers today and talk about. Yes. Now, we hear this quite often where the people say, and, and let's, let's just let's give some context. We are a people who believe that there must be a criteria by which you can recognize a man from God. There has to be a very proper method that God expects us to use. It cannot be a random lottery win where you mm. actually found the right answer and, you know, it's like yeah. it's not one of those show, those game shows. It's not who, who wants to be a millionaire and then you actually got the, the right answer yes. so you get to be a millionaire. There has to be a way to find the actual treasure which is the man that God sends with his spirit in him. So if it's not random, if it's not good fortune and good luck that hits you, if it's not just an accident, a happy accident, if it's a method, if there's a process, a due process that you have to follow that's been established by God and vouched for by people from him and stamped and sealed and signed off as this is the method that the people have to use to identify the man from him, then what is that method? Now we say we know what that method is. We call it the law of knowing the vicegerent. But when we ask people of other schools of thought and we say to them, well, what is the way that you're going to use to find out who the Mahdi is? Then we find very fascinating answers, which are quite random and quite arbitrary. Very interesting to hear, though, because yes. it's great um, discussion content. And something that we heard a lot from uh, the Sunni school of thought is, well, it's very simple, really. All you have to do is find the man whose name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Mm -hmm. As soon as you find a man by that name, that is the Mahdi. And we find that very fascinating because I think there are quite a few people out there with that name. Yes. And yes. it's a strange way to identify a man from God with his spirit in him. That he has to have this particular Sick, name. Right. And if he has this name, that's it. You found the Mahdi. Yeah. I mean, people change their name all the time, right? It's, they do. <laughs> it's just somebody who wakes up on the wrong side of, of the bed and has a, a, like a mental illness or they have this dream or it's been something that has been evoked by uh, taking certain substances and then mm. they're like, okay, I'm going to change my name to Muhammad ibn happen. Abdullah. It could happen, And uh, right? yeah, that's my claim because my name is this name and the narration say that it will be this name and that's the end of it. And that can't be the case. Of course it can't be the case. And uh, this is something I want you to... Sort of unpack for us. Well, yes. let's start by putting a very important narration on the screen. And we can talk about why it is that it's the, the case that uh, scholars of Sunni Islam are adamant that this is one of the best ways to identify Imam al-Mahdi. Let's put it on the screen and see what it is that was said back in the day. So we can read it together. It says here, it's a, it's a narration by Sunan Abi Dawood. And it says, I'm just waiting for it to go onto the screen. It says, narrated by Abdullah ibn Masood, the Prophet said, If only one day of this world remained, Allah would lengthen that day till he raised up in it a man who belongs to me or to my family, whose father's name is the same as my father's, who will fill the earth with equity and justice as it has been filled with oppression and tyranny. According to the version of Fitr, Sufyan's version says, the, the world will not pass away before the Arabs are ruled by a man of my family, whose name will be the same as mine. So that is an interesting narration. And this narration, where you might have realized it says mm. that he will have the same name as me, yes. uh, that is what the, uh, the scholars of Sunni Islam have kind of clung to and said, ha, that's it. That's the identifying factor. If we just find that, we're going to be good to go. Now, why is that not going to work? Why is it that that's not the way? Well, it, it, like you said, Dr. Fun, anyone can change their name. It doesn't really make sense mm -hmm. that that be the, 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 the reason. But there's another fascinating part of it, which is that what name? Which name are we talking about? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it going to be Muhammad itself? Mm -hmm. Doesn't Prophet Muhammad have many names? Does, uh, does the Prophet Muhammad known by Mahmud, by Ahmed, by Mustafa, uh, Yasin? He has many, many Taha. names and titles. And uh, which name are we talking about exactly? You know, the, the, it's not specific. It's not clear. And God, if anything, in the matter of appointment of the vicegerent, is absolutely clear and very, very specific. And this lacks both clarity and specificity. 
Absolutely. And uh, there are narrations that talk about the fact that he has different names. We can go to the next one on the screen right now and take a look at an example of that. So it says here, narrated by Jubair ibn Muthim, Allah's Messenger said, I have five names. I am Muhammad and Ahmed. I am Al-Mahi through whom Allah will eliminate infidelity. I am Al-Hashir who will be the first to be resurrected, the people being resurrected thereafter. And I am also Al-Aqib, uh, that is, there will be no Prophet after me. That's in Bukhari. Now, these are just some of the names of Prophet Muhammad that are listed in this narration. And like you said, there are so many. Mm -hmm. So if it's not specific and it's very vague, what are we meant to do? Well, the first thing I think we should do is realize that being so confining to God and saying, well, it has to be a name Muhammad ibn Abdullah is a little bit unfair because both the Prophet and his father could be seen by different names. Right. So bottom line is it can't be the case that it's just the name. The name in and of itself is not enough to know if a man is from God or not. Now, the Holy Quran itself actually presents two names of Prophet Muhammad which are very interesting. And I, I'm quite amazed by this uh, call of Imam al-Mahdi because it really has all the answers. It really does. We are saying to the world that there are two individuals who are from the 12 Mahdi's of Prophet Muhammad's will and testament. And we are saying that their names are Ahmed and Abdullah. Yes. The world is saying that the Mahdi has to have the name of Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Now, does he? Does the Mahdi have the name of Prophet Muhammad? Let's put that verse on the screen that's coming up next. Uh, if you can just please go ahead and read that for us, Dr. Irfan. Yes, uh, this one. Uh, and yeah. Yes, and mention when Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, indeed I am the messenger of Allah to you, confirming what came before me of the Torah and bringing good tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name is Ahmed. But when he, Ahmed, came to them with clear proofs, they said, This is plain magic. So now we know that when Jesus himself is bringing the, the call to the people and saying that there will be a man after me, he uses a name, Ahmed. Right. He doesn't say Muhammad. Mm -hmm. He says Ahmed. So Ahmed is a name that the Mahdi could have, isn't it? I mean, exactly. let's put that on the table hypothetically. Right. Why not? And there are other names that the Mahdi could have as well, such as the next one that we can place on the screen right now that is again mentioned in the Holy Quran. And if we read it together, it says... And when Abdullah, or the servant of Allah, rose, they almost gathered around him in piles. Mm. Abdullah is another name of, of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad. So Ahmad and Abdullah are both names that are on the list that mm -hmm. could belong to the Mahdi. And lo and behold, they do. Mm. They do belong to two Mahdi's from the will of Prophet Muhammad. Absolutely incredible. It's, it's so concrete and so clear that if we were using that logic, it does play out. But now the people might be asking themselves, well, okay, you're saying it's not the name, then how do you know who the Mahdi is? What is the law that tells us who the Mahdi is? Yeah, and that is the, uh, the, the question of all questions because uh, this is something that goes back to something that was uh, written when the Prophet Muhammad said, in, in, we're talking about Sunni Islam here, uh, these are narrations within the Sahih books where the Prophet says, bring me a pen and paper and I will write for you something after which you will never go astray. And he was met with a lot of resistance uh, because the people in the know who were conspiring behind the scenes knew that uh, this thing that the Prophet wished to write was not his inheritance in terms of material inheritance. He was going to write the inheritors of the prophetic wisdom, the inheritors of the Holy Spirit, names that would rule after the Prophet Muhammad to ensure the continuity of his true religion. And it would be entrusted to the names that were mentioned inside his holy will, which we have with us mm. to this day and age. It is present, it is a central, central document in our creed because in it were mentioned the names of 12 Imams and then after them, the first three Mahdi's out of 12 Mahdi's. And the reason their names are mentioned is because they are the ones who have now come forward in this day and age claiming that very will that was written uh, with their names in it. And as Alia mentioned, the names Abdullah and Ahmed and Al-Mahdi, uh, all names attributable to the Prophet Muhammad, as we have proven with the hadith that we have read on the screen, uh, are definitely matching that criteria in the context of divine, direct divine appointment through the Holy Prophet Muhammad, the bearer of the Sixth Covenant. Exactly. And, and we know from the narrations that God is very just in his ways and he's not going to establish criteria that are random, as we said. 
And there are actual narrations that state that there are three things that you must find in a person to know that they are a vicegerent of God. There are three main cr criteria that have to be in a, in a vicegerent. Whether there are other criteria or not that are being met, these three have to be met. And all three of them have to be in one person. It cannot be that there's only one or only two. It has to be all three. And those three are what exactly? As you mentioned, there's a will that has within it names of the people who are coming next. Besides the will, there are two other very important criteria. The, uh, one of them is divine knowledge. Divine knowledge they have right. to know, they have to have that knowledge of the unseen, the knowledge of the mysteries of the heavens and the earth. They have to be able to display the knowledge that can help mankind, yes. that can take us to a better place. And they have to lead people to pledging allegiance to God alone mm -hmm. and to establish God's supremacy on earth. These three criteria, once you find them gathered in an individual, you can know that they are a true vicegerent. And if you do not find these criteria or you do not see that there is uh, something from them within a man, then absolutely he cannot be from God. How can a man be from God if he does not call people to God's allegiance? Or how can he be from God if he does not have divine knowledge? Mm -hmm. How can he be from God if he does not uh, have a claim in a will or a testament that is written by his predecessor? Now we know that the riser Abdullah Hashim Abu Sadiq is in fact that very individual who is exactly covering all three criteria uh, to a T. To a T. He is mentioned in the will of Prophet Muhammad as Abdullah. He has presented incredible divine knowledge that is right. leaving the world completely amazed. Right. And he's the one who raised the banner that says on it allegiance is to God. Yeah. All three in one uh, being and I think it's, it leaves no room for doubt. I mean, look at the knowledge aspect of what Abu Sadiq has revealed to the people. He has unveiled the mysteries of the Raja and he has made coherent sense out of the narrations, bringing them all together and using the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt to present its truth. He has revealed identities mm. of personalities that were lost in time, such as his recent revelation of uh, Luqman al-Hakim as this character called yes. Ahikar. Yes, that was an amazing episode, by the way. It, it was an absolutely amazing episode. And I read that book now, and it is literally that same kind of advice from father to son that is uh, full of wisdom and teachings and lessons. And uh, not only that, but the Qaim of the family of Muhammad has uh, revealed the, uh, he has revealed the uh, cure to many illnesses. Yes. And he has come with the, the hidden aspects of the religion and more and more revelation. He, he has revealed the truth of what happened to one of the most hotly contested aspects of religion, which is what happened to Jesus Christ at the time of crucifixion and after crucifixion. Why certain words were used about him in the Quran and no one knew this before and uh, who his successors were uh, in the immediate aftermath and then afterwards when he uh, left to continue his uh, da'wah yes. or his religion in another country. Uh, we always talk about those lost years of Jesus Christ and if you really want to know what happened with this very controversial historical religious character, then look no further than the goal of the wise and the lectures of Abba Sadiq. His knowledge is truly fantastic. It will leave you reeling, it will uh, leave you breathless because it's, it's a non-stop journey and he is making more and more revelations, answering questions that no scholar has been able to uh, answer ever until uh, he came forward with his claim as being the Mahdi, as being the Abdullah mentioned in the last will and testament of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Exactly, and uh, I hope that if the viewers out there have anything they'd like to say, they can write in and they can actually tell us that there is um, some doubt or room for doubt for them regarding the narration that we were discussing today and the misconception and how it's being read uh, in in a way that perhaps doesn't give it credit or doesn't give it the due, just, the due justice that it is due. So uh, definitely call in or write in if you want to talk about it more and we're going to move on now to our next segment. And our next segment has to do with, uh, a, it's a quick break really, it's a quick guided meditation break because we're going to be coming back after the break with a special guest to have a very nice conversation with him. I'm really excited yes, about that. I'm He's a very dear brother to, to us. Well. So um, stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, until the guest is here, let's do some guided meditation and we'll see you after that break. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for joining again. And thank you all who is the first time that you are uh, tuning in. Um, I make a small introduction here we do 
very small capsules of meditation and also we reflect a little bit about <coughs> certain things. Um, this time I wanted to talk about something that touched me um, a lot, which is trust. Um, we have to understand that um, all the attributes that God has given us, whether outerly, whether our senses, our body, our intelligence, the brain, our family, the world, the food, everything he had provided, also comes with a lot of inward attributes. And we are expected to put everything in service of goodness. And there is nothing more good than God himself. Um, so that means that we need to put all those attributes in service of God. So if he as um, con conscious, because consciousness is not something that every uh, being in creation has, like we are conscious of many things and that's in itself already a gift. So to be conscious of having an attribute which is called trust, it's already something uh, magnificent, it's already a big gift. And um, I was reading the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavad Gita has this part where it says, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, it's a book where Krishna is talking to Arjuna. Krishna at that moment is the Imam, is, is, is the appointed man uh, by God to guide humanity, to guide Arjuna. And they have this magnificent, magnificent dialogue before going to battle. And in one of those things that Krishna is teaching him, he says, I am the beginning, the middle, and the end. And if you put that into any man of God, and God himself, it makes you actually, and putting together the thing with trust, it makes you actually believe that, or understand that trust is an attribute given by God and God always wants us to do good. Once you meet the Huja and you know that everything, every single thing he does, he does it for good, for goodness, for justice, for what is right, then you know that you need to use that attribute for goodness. Now we have God saying I am, or the representative of God saying I am the beginning, the middle or the end. We don't have a choice. We may think we have a choice with God, but we don't have a choice. We need to find that man. And once we find him, we need to let everything go, everything in that man's hands. Because God had not put trust in ourselves without ever thinking that we have to find also a rightful man where to put our trust towards. So he provides this attribute of trust and he provides the safety and the good expression of that trust, which is this man chosen by him, acting like him, following his will, in which we can put that trust. So. It is beautiful to see that we are allowed a maximum, the maximum expression and we are expected to have the maximum expression of goodness and that's the only way that we would know God and paradoxically we can only know God by knowing the man and how he acts. So glad tidings to everybody who already have recognized in Abbasadik that man and for those who is the first time you're tuning in and you don't know about which man I'm talking, you can stay with us and keep on watching our shows. You can go to our YouTube, you can go to our TikTok, you can go to our Facebook. You can research on that man that um, God has always provided for us to go to the maximum of those good expressions, good traits he has put in, inside of us. So having said this and feeling also that on one hand I learned with my kids that trust is the most natural thing. Imagine they are born, they can't talk, they can't walk, 
they can't do, they can't defend themselves, they can't accuse anyone, they can't say anything. They're in the most helpless state, and yet they trust so much. They trust, that's the natural state. And that's natural in us too. So we are invited to go back to what's natural, what is, what is, yeah, our natural way to be. Whether in life we have been hurt so much, we have seen so much darkness, we have seen so much self, so much selfishness, so much I give you this, but you give me that, that actually we lost that trust. But again, um, that attribute has to have a place to be explored and expanded in maximum expression. Asana always says, when you prepare a cake for someone, you expect that person to eat it all, not to just look at it or take like like one little bit of it and eat it. So God does the same. When he gives us something, he wants us to fulfill it fully. And so let's go into that state of complete helplessness, but at the same time understand that by that trust you are held by this innate perfect goodness. And we are going now to do as we always do. We're gonna scan a little bit our body, which helps us a lot to stop with the inner noise and also to bring, to renew the energy, to cleanse the energy and to be aware of how we are supposed to be along the day. Meditation is not something that we just do sitting and in that 15 minutes meditation is a state of alertness it's a state of mind, it's an exercise, it's a duty also towards your imam and God to keep yourself clean and sharp so that you can serve better. So, and to everybody around you, obviously. Let's go to this um, small relaxation. We're going to start with a breathing. We're going to breathe in and we're going to fill our belly with air as much as we can. As I always say, you can start closing your eyes, finding yourself a comfortable position. Try that if it's not needed, try not to lay down if that's what you need uh, because of your physical conditions or how you are right now, you can lay down. Otherwise, try to keep certain alertness, try to uh, sit straight but comfortable know that along the small meditation you're also going to be able to uh, accommodate or, or change your body or move so don't worry about it but now that you have found uh, this position we are going to feel we're going to scan ourselves from the top of our head down to our face, to our neck, to our chest, to our heart, to our inner organs, hips, legs, knees, ankles, feet, hands, arms. And we're going to start just from here, just expanding and relaxing that body. We're going to take the deep breath and fill our belly with air. And we go. And we hold. And we exhale. And we hold. And we breathe in. We hold. We exhale, we hold, we breathe in, and we hold, we exhale, and we hold without breathing in, and we breathe in. And we relax. 
we move a bit our body if we need it we don't allow any tension to stay in our body and we're gonna bring our shoulders to our ears in a deep breath and then let go go and let go again shoulders to our ears breathing in and let it go now we're gonna do our head to the right trying that the right ear touches the right shoulder without doing any any pressure just the intention and let the weight of your head fall to the right side and then slowly slowly you take it to the center and you go all the way to the left leaning your head towards your left shoulder having this image of the left ear touching the left shoulder if you feel tension in the right shoulder you can do it up and down you can also inhale when you do it up and uh, exhale when you do it down and you will feel how much space is is given by doing that simple breathing and now we're going to rotate and put our chin to our chest very slowly very gently without any strain without any force and we're going to let gravity do its thing we're going to bend our back a little bit and we're gonna get straight slowly slowly the head goes up and the upper part of our head gets completely straight we can roll our shoulders back and we relax and now we're gonna do a simple simple scanning and renewing the energy of the body we start with our toes, we wiggle them, we put attention into them and we fill them with light. We go to our feet, we fill them with light and we give its weight to gravity, the weight to gravity. We go to our ankles, we relax them, our lower part of the legs. We scan them up and down, we massage them from within, we let it expand. All the atoms are mixed with the atmosphere and we relax it, we let it full of light. We go to our knees, we fill them with light, we relax them. We go to our thighs, we experience them from up to down. If you need to arrange your body, do so and we feel our thighs and fill them with light and we relax them how our body is touching the floor we acknowledge that and we give our weight to space we go up to our inner organs we massage them we acknowledge them we thank them for all the work that they do. We thank God for all the work that he does for us. We fill them with light and we go all the way up to the chest. We fill it with light. We fill our heart with light, the lightest light, with forgiveness towards others and towards ourselves with new chances, with new starting points, with all the good intentions of following God guidance. We are not carrying anything except for the will of God. Remember, you can always do these kind of exercises to keep the attention on your body to reset your body and not to attention of these thoughts but just come and go remember the shaitan is always whispering 
if it makes you feel bad is from the shaitan you don't have to listen to it you don't have to believe it you're a believer in god whenever you are ready you can open your eyes if you want to stay like this please do so me myself i will open my eyes i will thank you thank you so much for staying tuned for staying with me through this meditation Going back into the uh, the topic for today, we were talking today about covenants changing and the evolution of rituals and practices through time. Yes. But we were wanting to start with his journey first. Yeah, I love to hear, like I said, about the journeys of the Ansar, and especially Brother Yahya, who was one of the first to arrive uh, with Abbas Salik to support him in Egypt because he saw something in this great man, uh, Abdullah Hashim, that even before he had claimed the will of the Messenger of Allah, in which his name is written as Abdullah, there were certain traits and attributes about Abbas Sadiq that you had seen, Yahya, that at a very early, tender, young age in your youth, at the prime of your youth, you decided uh, to leave your home in the U.S. and migrate to Egypt. Can you tell us about your journey? I think the people would really benefit from it and I think there'll be lots of lessons for us to, to contemplate on and talk about. Yes, uh, first off, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, my journey with, with knowing who Abu Sadiq from Hemis Peace is began 14 years ago. And it was through his works, you know, through his, uh, through his works like the arrivals and the series that he was producing in that time, which really opened my eyes to true Islam, which opened up my eyes to reading and knowing about the narrations of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. And for me, that was truly a, a remarkable feeling because I found their words to be words that brought peace to me, you know, words that brought a lot of uh, truth into my life. And they spoke about many things. They spoke about end time signs. They spoke about, you know, the Mahdi. They spoke about signs of his appearance. So when Abu Sadiq from him his peace had began their arrivals, he was exposing a lot of the tyranny that was in the world. He was exposing the, you know, the media industry, the tyrannical forces that are at play and the satanic system that mm -hmm. existed in the world. And I could see that clearly, evidently, in my day-to-day -day life. I could see that the world was filled with a lot of darkness. There was a war going on at the time in Iraq with the invasion of American forces into Iraq in, in the early 2000s. Mm. So for me, I could see the, 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 the clear signs. I could see that there, the, 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 the world was full of war, it was full of poverty, it was full of injustice. I could see that mankind was degrading, right? So I didn't want to follow that path that I, that I saw so many people walking towards, which was one of degradation, one of having no spirituality, having no connection to God. Mm. And the only voice that I found which was truly calling to God and truly calling towards something that I could see which was good was Abu Sadiq from mm. Hemis Peace. Mm. And yeah, this was at a time in my life where I was, I was looking for God. Yes. I was looking for God, and I, I did not find, you know, in the world any voice of truth except His. Mm -hmm. And a lot of His works were based off of narrations from Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. And for me, learning about them, the imams from them is peace. I began to see that their words were no different to the words of the prophets and the messengers and they were no different to, to the words of Jesus who also had an impact in my life because I was raised Catholic. Yes. So I knew, I could see the truth basically in the words, I could see the light that was in the words of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad and that just drew me towards wanting to know more about yeah. them. And um, yeah, I was so, he was that only voice. He was the only flag, a standard bearer that was standing for the truth in that time. You recognize that caller in the wilderness in this day and age. And uh, what I was particularly fascinated about, and I think for the benefit of our audience, uh, just to explain that transition from uh, Catholicism. You mm. were obviously born and raised in California in the United States. Um, were you a practicing Catholic, a Christian 
uh, like a churchgoer, you said obviously you were looking for God, clearly a very spiritual person looking for answers in the darkness of the age that we live in, like you mentioned, the satanic system that exists clearly around us, which is geared to serving the elites uh, at the cost of the majority. But uh, tell us about that transition that you made from uh, Catholicism. Were you a practicing Catholic? Were you somebody who was a churchgoer? Did you see that uh, side of life growing up? For the most part, part no, because uh, I was raised on, on Catholicism, but I wasn't taught what Catholicism was. Mm. So it was just something that you carried by name, mm. right? A religion that you carry on your back and you say, identify with. So you, you would say, I'm Catholic, but truly you wouldn't know what Catholicism is, at, at least from my, from my stance and my, on my journey. And, um, and really, I, I would say for the most part, the majority of people are like that. They don't truly know what their religion actually teaches. Right. And, and uh, perhaps they go to church, and which is something that I was doing when I began, when I decided to make that spiritual journey. I started to read the Bible, I started to go to church and listen to what the, the pastors were saying, you know. But for the most part, everyone just goes back to their normal lives as if uh, nothing has changed. And I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to walk that same path. I didn't want to. I wanted to ha take some sort of action to make a change, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to actually apply the the teachings and the words and and make a make a, a difference in in my life and you know just walk in in, in my life in knowing God basically. Yeah. So, did you find fulfillment at, when you were going to church, uh, hearing from the? Uh, the clerics or uh, I guess the priests in Catholicism, were they making sense to you? Did they satisfy you? You said that it was almost like a fragmented lifestyle where you would go to the church and then you would come back home and it was the same uh, life and then you would go back to church again or maybe on a Sunday, maybe once a month. But uh, did you find the, the clerics or the uh, people who were teaching you religion to really meet that human need of that, that satisfying answer about who is God, where is God and what is God? Um, no, I didn't. You know, and uh, you know, at that because I was 18 at the time, right? This is the so, key point. You were so young mm -hmm. in your journey. I mean, this is 18 is when you basically finish high school, right? You're just right. going from high school to college, and, and this is the time of your life where you uh, discovered the work of Allah Sabik in the form of the arrivals first, right? This is how you yeah. that chapter opened for you, yeah. So it was a crossroads in my life where you know, it's either I go to college or I go to military or I go to do something in my life, right? Start a family or right. there's so many options that you can take. Mm. So I was at a crossroads in my life and I had to sit down with myself, contemplate over what I wanted to be in life. And I came to the conclusion that I wanted to know God. Subhanallah. Right? I wanted to know God and I wanted to, 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 to walk that path of yeah. a disciple, basically. And um, yeah, that was... As for the church and, and the pastors, I never felt like they provided much value aside from what was already mentioned in the scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. So their interpretation of events or of Jesus being a part of a trinity, like this didn't affect me because I was not believing in that. Mm -hmm. I, I knew that there was one God and, you know, that that drew me towards walking and finding Islam, right? basically. And when I converted to Islam and I became Muslim, you know, I was thinking that I would find Muslims who would also be in a in accordance or understand the words from Muhammadan's family, right? Because that's yeah. what all of Islam is. But I found that the people were not like that actually, and most of them were people who stuck to their rituals which was fine at the time, and which is something that I was doing too, right? Mm. But aside from that, like there was no, it was no different than Christianity. There was no emphasis on that extra knowing of God. Yes, it was just, like, if you do this, you'll be good, and you'll go into the hereafter, you go to paradise, and I was not satisfied with that because Abbas Sadiq was revealing in his videos that it's not just about that. Right? It's not just about having a desire for paradise, nor a fear of hell, mm. but it's, it's, it's knowing God, essentially. Right? So you, you're not affected by these things. 
And at that time, there was still this fear of hell in me, right? Or this desire for paradise, thinking that that's the ultimate goal. Goal, right. Um, but along the journey, you find out that that's not the goal. Yeah. It's not the goal just to avoid hellfire or to reach paradise. There's a much greater goal. Mm. And uh, there's a famous hadith, if I believe, if my memory serves me correct, from Imam Ali, where yes. he says, I don't fear, you know, hellfire because of its punishment, nor do I desire the hereafter because of paradise. Of, you know, of paradise. So there was a lot of just spirituality that I found within the words of, you know, the hadiths of the Ahlul Bayt from the Mispis. And the only person that was providing that nutrition to my body, to my mind, to my soul was Abu Sadiq. And, you know, he was a very spiritual man. He would, you know, in his works, he would share the hadiths of fasting, for example, and how there's this, for example, this 40-day journey that a believer can take. And... Mm where you don't fast the 30 days, you fast the 40 days. So for me, as a recent convert to Islam, I wanted to do everything that was above and beyond the ordinary. So I didn't want to just fast the normal 30 days. Mm. You know, I didn't want to just pray the five obligatory prayers, but I wanted to do above and beyond that. I wanted to do the 40-day fasting. I wanted to do the extra night prayers. I wanted to do the, uh, the prayers before Fajr, mm. right? And even in Ramadan, there's even more prayers that the believer can do and all of these are based off of the books right from yes. the Ahlul Bayt so I was trying to apply everything that I was reading and I wanted to do everything no matter how hard it was you know there's there's even times where they say if you pray a thousand rakat for, for example a thousand prayers that you know your prayer would be accepted so when I was doing those things and I was praying my thousand I actually did it once when I was still back home mm -hmm. this was Around the time that Abu Sadiq was releasing the uh, the the appearance of the Yamani, ah, right. So before that, I was praying to God. I said, "God, just guide me to the truth. I want to know the truth." Mm -hmm. And then shortly afterwards, Abu Sadiq reveals that the Yamani has appeared. And so you completing the thousand prayers and the revelation of the Yamani kind of coincide at the same point in it time. It was in the same time. Amazing. It was in the same time. And. Um, Yes, yeah, so I wanted to know more about uh, what, what Abu Sadiq was revealing in his episodes. At that time, it was Taj II, the second semester, yes, which was one of his works. And he had revealed that the Yamani had appeared. And when he said that, I had no idea what the Yamani was or mm -hmm. who the Yamani was. We were all or... learning at that point who these names were and these characters, but they were mentioned all this time in the narrations, and the scholars hadn't really taught their people so much about it. Mm -hmm. So it was when Abu Sadiq brought it into the forefront that we knew now that there was someone like that. Yeah, and that he's the Yamani and that he, there's this hadith that says that he calls, he has a banner and that he calls basically to uh, allegiance is to God. Mm. And that you have to pledge allegiance to him and the people that don't pledge allegiance to him, then they're from the people of hellfire. So for me to, to have known this hadith at that time, I knew that uh, this is a matter between heaven and hell. Like, if you believe in the Yamani, then you're in, you're safe. Mm. But if you disbelieve in him, then, you know, it's pretty much your, your journey is done. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to reflect once again. I had to decide whether or not I believed in this narration, whether or not I believed in the Yamani. And once again, I was fasting and I was praying. And, you know, it was a very um, spiritually difficult time in my life because you know you have your family members you have your friends and I was going to community college at the time so there's just a whirlwind of a dilemma happening in my life and now there's this Yemani that's appeared and is this something that I truly believe in mm. because if I truly believe in it then I have to wholeheartedly accept whatever comes from it right and I have yes. to take that step to walk mm -hmm. the journey. It's not just, for me, it wasn't just a matter of speaking what I believe in, but actually walking the path. Working by what you believe in. Exactly. So I remember um, one, one great sign for me personally was when I was at a, pretty much at my lowest point and I had 
read at the time there's Hashem Studios board. So this is where many people would post hadiths, uh, which was the, the forum the of forum, yeah. Abba Salik. And um, basically they said that if you make prayer and you call upon the Imam, that your prayer would be accepted, right. type of thing. So I'm thinking to myself that I believe, like I've seen enough proof from Abba Salik about the Yemani and generally just about the Ahlul Bayt that is making me inclined towards believing, like, but I just need that extra sign, mm. right? And I wasn't receiving any dreams at the time, even though many people were receiving dreams, but I was believing their dreams, right? Mm. So I had made prayer, um, but the only difference this time was that instead of calling upon Allah or calling upon Ar-Rahman or Ar-Rahim, mm. I called upon the name of Ahmed al-Hassan, I said, Ahmed al-Hassan, if this is truth, please show me the way. And at that time, instantly, I felt this sense of peace that completely pushed away my fears and, you know, this worry that I, ha that I had in my heart. And I took that immediately as a sign that this is, this is it, like... He is who he says he is, mm. because I wouldn't have felt that way. It was a, a testimony from God to me, mm. right? Wow. This is something that I bear witness to. Mm. Wow. That's so different to the, the norm, right? People normally speak about these visions or dreams that they have in response uh, to a prayer that they made to God. But for you, the proof is very significantly different. And it is a proof for you because you said that you were at this stage in your life where you're, um, you're at this crossroads uh, in, in the U.S. and the world is your oyster and you're trying to make that decision about which way you want your life to go mm. and all these thoughts are percolating in your mind. And in that moment of stress and anxiety and just that spiritual yearning to find God, you, you, you go into this chaotic state within and then instantly uh, there is peace descending upon you and you feel that inner tranquility, and this is a proof for you, uh, the, the, the sudden nature of the response of God was, be at peace. Yeah. Uh, in response to your question to the Imam of the time, and, uh, and it very closely matches these, uh, these, uh, the most latest sermon of Abba Sadiq, this uh, in the Divine School of Mysteries, this talk that he gives about seeing the Imam everywhere, yes. right? That he is, uh, wheresoever you turn, you shall see the face of God. And this direct plea to the Imam of the time, who was Ahmed al Hassan the Yamani, whose news had been uh, had reached you, that's what made the difference in that moment. And it was the sudden descending of tranquility that was a proof for you in that moment. That's fascinating. Yeah, so that was pretty much my initiation into believing in Ahmed al Hassan. And the next step was this big. Uh, this next great big concept which was making hijra yeah because big decision to make in around march or april of 2011 abu Salik had announced the yamani but he was also saying if you want to join me you can join me all right so there yes. were many people who were pledging public publicly their allegiance to the yamani and many people were actually going to egypt and joining up with abu Salik mm. for the most peace and for the next few months, I was now contemplating, is this something that I'm ready to do, right? So I, once again, went back to my prayer. I said, look, like, I received the sign that I have to receive. Now it's like, should I make, I did an yeah. istikhara. I basically asked God if this is something that you want me to do. Yeah. Mm. And I did my istikhara and it came out positive. And immediately I said, okay, this is what I have to do because to anyone who makes istikhara is answered by God mm. if, they, if they truly sincerely ask for it. Yeah. And that's all I did. I truly sincerely asked God whether or not this is something that I should do. And it came out positive. And I said, you know what? I have a few hundred dollars saved up in my bank account and I have a few possessions left over. I'm going to sell all my possessions and buy my ticket to go to Egypt. And subhanAllah, like everything that I had in my bank account, plus the things that I sold, was just enough to buy one way ticket. One-way ticket to the car. It was my <laughs> one-way amazing. ticket. And I was... What a sign of, of approval that is, actually. Yeah, it truly was. And 
it was just enough to buy one ticket and I said, you know what, that's it. I informed my parents about it and they were, they were, you know, they said, okay, son, go ahead, do what you have to do. And I booked my ticket and I went to Egypt and that was the start of my journey with Abu Salik. That's so beautiful. And you really are that example you're here for those out there who are wondering, uh, where do I start? You, you laid out a very amazing kind of step-by-step uh, mm. -step process through that uh, hero's journey that you made. And you um, were grateful that you are here with us today because you can be that example to those out there who are watching and listening. And perhaps they are wondering, how do I find the courage within myself? And something that, that kind of uh, you can see uh, through your story, an example of what you've done, is that you actually took the faith in your heart that you had for God and you trusted him with the answers he gave you. So when he would respond to you, you held on to his answer and you'd move forward with it. And I think that is something that everyone needs to kind of contemplate. Are they doing that or not? Are they trusting God? Are they having faith in his answers to them or not? And you really have shown that you did do that every step of the way, which is what led you to where you are today. And I'd love for you to kind of highlight for everyone listening what does it mean to be a supporter of the Rise of Abbasadik? You are one of those examples that are a dedicated supporter and always have been and are proving to be dedicated in every day of your life for the same cause, which is this, this uh, mission that we have of building that divine just state uh, hand in hand with the Rise of Abbasadik. You're one of those people who are doing so. Can you explain what it means to be a supporter? Um, that's a big question, I think. Um, but for personally i would say that you know one just has to stay sincere and never forget you know where you come from mm. and remember that you've made an oath to god and if you realize that you made an oath to god then you know it's 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 an everlasting oath mm. You know, and a man is his word, as we've learned from Ahmed Hassan. And for me personally, my support to Abu Sadiq is to always be that support mm. for him. To do anything I can to, to pave the way for the religion, for the divine just state, for the establishment of the divine just state on earth. And to, and to yes, just to give him victory. And there is nothing greater in the world that one can do except giving victory to, you know, the awaited Mahdi, the, the Qa'im of the family of Muhammad, the man who will establish peace and justice on earth. And I'm a witness to that. Mm -hmm. I have seen over these past 14 years how Abu Sadiq, his character is, and how he takes care of others first before his own self, and how we have truly been living in a small divine just state with him, even though it's not encompassed the world yet, which is the promise of God and will happen. But the fact that I've been with him these past 14 years and seen from him many things, you know, I've seen the sustenance of God just flow upon the community. I've seen great miracles. And if you truly want to be a supporter of him, then it just require, requires that one step towards God. Yeah. That's all it takes. That's very well said. Very well said. And I think one thing that I certainly took out of the journey, the great journey of Brother Yahya towards the riser of the family of Muhammad, that he trusted in God completely and he took action when he was given a clear sign. You know, don't be one of those people who who make a sincere prayer and then doubt in their prayer and doubt if God is answering them. If you get a sign through an istikhara, through a dream or through that unique experience that Brother Yahya described where his whole body was filled with sakina, uh, which was a sign from God from him and a, and a singular and a specific message to him. And that was sufficient for him to make that decision and not uh, go back on that decision and really be a man who is fully dedicated and devoted to the rise of the family of Muhammad. He's an upstanding member of our community and an inspiration for all of us. I hope uh, those listening to his story have been inspired and enthused and they will take the same path as what Brother Yahya took and arrive to the proof of God in this time, the Imam of the earth, which is the riser of the family of Muhammad Abbas Sadiq. 
So thank you once again, Brother Yahya, for actually taking the time to sit with us and talk to us. We really enjoyed that conversation with you. Alhamdulillah. It's been an honor. Thank you. God bless you. And uh, we're going to wrap up the show now, and we'll be seeing you guys again on Sunday. And uh, until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.